Okay, so we are being recorded now. And as people join, I'll just admit them if we have more people. I, I think we have a few more people I was expecting to come on, so they may come later. Um, oh, there's somebody right now. Let me just get them in. The more the merrier. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, oh, it's um, fun. Yeah, it's fun. Hello, Vaughn. We're just getting started. So thank you, everybody, for coming to our Name Monday Night series. This is um, our talk on crayfish tonight. But for next month, I want to make sure I always let everybody know, please come next month. It's going to be on Monday, April 12th. And Ooh, it'll be Astonishing Analyst by Dr. Louise Page, University of Victoria, who was just telling us a little bit about it earlier. So thank you for joining us tonight. We look forward to hearing your talk next month. Um, we are recording. And once we get started, if you can put yourself on mute just during the talk so that the speakers can have control. And um, if it slows down for any reason, sometimes turning off your video helps if you're having issues and slowing. If you have questions, please put them in the chat box. We will monitor the chat box. And if it, if it seems like it's good timing, we might interrupt and ask you guys while you're presenting to answer a question yeah. right off the bat. Or we'll just wait until the end um, if you're in the middle of talking about something and it doesn't flow with the talk. Um, yeah, so you guys ready? We're going to hear from Janice Elridge tonight from our National, uh, National Park Service, National Recreation Areas of Lake Roosevelt. And she's also the founder and the executive director of the River Mile Network. She's been with National Parks for 29 years, mm -hmm. so a long time. Um, Rick Reynolds from Engaging Every Student is an educator and enjoys doing education resources and developing education resources and working with the Park Service. And Jim Etkins from the University of Idaho Extension. He is the Water Educator Professor for the Extension Unit. Thanks you guys so much for coming. We're looking forward to your talk tonight. And unless yeah. there's anything else, I will pass it off to you. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. I will kick it off here. Let's see. This one. Did it work? <laughs> yes, it worked. Yay. Yay. <laughs> hey. All right. Well, um, as she said, my name is Janice Elvidge. I am the education specialist at Lake Roosevelt National Recreation Area. I'm also the founder and executive director of the River Mile Network. And um, I'll just go a real brief introduction to the River Mile um, and the pieces that um, will introduce both Rick and Jim. Uh, let's see here. Come on. It does not want to advance. No, oh, there it is. <laughs> Little now little. the question is, how much will it advance? How many will it advance? <laughs> um, I like to bring up early on uh, the essential question for the River Mile because this is what drives everything that we do in development and uh, teaching teachers, working with students, um, and ex and expanding uh, what we offer. Uh, how do our re relationships among components of an ecosystem affect watershed health? The nice thing about this, this essential question is it does not take the assumption of science only or water only. It is all about all components in the watershed. And so this allows many groups to participate, uh, ones that may not even think about uh, wanting to go out and collect water samples or something like that. You know, it could be cultural. How has the Columbia River watershed changed over the years? And one of the, the main thing about the River Mile is networking. And that's why when it first, when I first brought it out in 2007, 2008, we were the River Mile and it was just a program within Lake Roosevelt, uh, a, a number of schools that I, I actually have 26 school districts that I worked with and I pilot tested all of this with about eight. 
And I, I soon realized that a traditional program where I went out and did programs for students and teachers just brought them to me, that wasn't gonna work. Um, I'm 90% of my time, I am the only education person at the park. And with 29 school districts and working with K through 12, uh, this wasn't gonna work very well. So networking became my, my focus, my point, really what I'm, I'm after with the River Mile is connecting people and resources. And so when, when I began the expansion in 2012, uh, we began working on, I, at that time, there was not a, a website. You can see that one of our main networking pieces is uh, the rivermile.org. Um, we didn't have that. I had hoped I would be able to get something like that. In fact, much of what you see here, I had hoped we could do, had no idea how I was going to get there. But through networking, and I strongly encourage people to have lots and lots of, of partners and people that they network with. Through that, we've been able to develop quite a bit. So our network offers our website. Also on the website is, we actually have a community where people can, the most active one is our crayfish community, but we have others available as groups become active. And it's where we can share, uh, just like any other social type place where you can share documents, ask questions and things like that. As many of you probably know, we do um, electronic newsletters, um, not on a set schedule, it's when I have information um, and people send me stuff. And so uh, try and get those out as often as I can. So if you, this is a hint, if you have anything, please let me know and I'd be happy to get it in our next newsletter. And if it is time sensitive, that really tells me when I need to get it out. We do have a number of in-person and online things for people to do. Um, we've done webinars. We do online um, virtual live training. We also have our in-person training, which hopefully this summer we can begin um, offering that again. And we have the asynchronous on-demand virtual training um, for the crayfish. So, um, after the pandemic, I do not see us going back to only one, any one of them. The virtual is, has been very popular, has been the number of people who've said, thank you, I would never be able to go to your in-person training. I've heard enough of that, that we'll be keeping, we'll be doing that. We do also use um, Facebook to some extent uh, we will be featuring much more with ArcGIS Online. That's how we collect our data um, and share the data. And we're working with an, a number of groups in, especially with crayfish, a number of groups to kind of help us with that. And then we have just started a speaker series very similar to this um, called our Community Gatherings. And it's on the fourth Wednesday of every month. Used to say the last Wednesday, but then I scheduled the March one and realized it's actually the fourth Wednesday. <laughs> so, um, and those right now we've been doing a lot with crayfish because that's what's so prevalent in our minds. And, but we are moving forward uh, in um, April, well actually March, Jim Eakins will be doing Clean Water Act. And then in April, um, working with the US Forest Service and they're going to have like their hydrologists in, up in the, I think it's the Pend Oreille area um, talk about the Columbia River watershed in their areas because they got quite a bit of water up there for the watershed. So that will be our April one. I hit click. Did it? Has, it hasn't turned yet. It's trying. Is it? I hate to hit it <laughs> again. Yet, but... <laughs> okay, I'll do it again. Um, I mentioned, we, as some of you probably know, we do have several projects. The most active is the crayfish study. But we also can um, move forward with both plant and animal inventories. That's actually where we started that and, and water quality. Um, so we do have that ability as it becomes needed. And then um, I'm most thrilled to have Jim Eakins join us with uh, the Master Water Stewards Program uh, from Idaho. And he'll be telling you guys about it. But we struggled for so long with, you know, how do we do this? Where does the data go? 
And when I um, met Jim and we started talking about it, it's like, let's expand it outside of Idaho. And so we will, the River Mile, the Columbia River Watershed, we will be contributing data to this very long-term um, database that uh, the Ida H2O and Master Water Stewards have been doing. So it's, it's so cool to have that. As I mentioned, I've been a staff of one, but networking partners has been the real key to the success of the River Mile. Um, for example, just uh, some of you may have heard me talking about, you know, we'll see what happens. I, I plan to retire from the National Park Service this year. I would love to do it at the end of July, but it may be a little later. I'm putting on an astronomy training. So if you know people, and it's for teachers. So if you know anybody who wants a multi-day astronomy training with big telescopes, um, have them get in touch with me. <laughs> take that hat off. But the, the partners are really what take everything forward. And these partners are what are helping keep the River Mile Network moving forward and um, obtaining a life kind of of its own. It's not all in my head like it was. And different people are helping with the success of it. And so the list of partners up here are really, oh, these guys have picked up, <laughs> picked up huge balls to carry for this and, and are running with them. Um, and so I, I, but there are many, many more partners uh, that have really contributed to the, the ongoing success of the River Mile. And I, I end with the watershed, but as I think, Rick will, and both Jim, we really uh, aren't limited now. Oh, well, that was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll go back to this one. We really aren't limited to the Columbia River watershed itself. Because we're looking at watershed health, those things apply to all watersheds over the entire world. So we are gathering information and data. We have an online library that um, we still want to continue to populate. And so those things, and they're on the web, so those things are accessible to anybody anywhere. And um, through the crayfish study, we have learned that, yeah, there are people all over that are really interested in, especially the crayfish part of it. So I am going to turn it over to Rick. Um, he'll be look, um, sharing with you the crayfish study and then Jim will be in and out of there as well with water. So Rick, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Sure. Yeah. There's do you mind? Um, do you mind uh, stop sharing uh, your yeah. screen, Janice, and then I'll be able to share mine and bring that up. Okay. So, yeah, I was thrilled to connect with Janice at a um, WSTA conference uh, a few years ago, and we started talking about a crayfish curriculum, and now we have it. So, um, I'm going to kind of talk you through. Uh, the uh, lessons we have available and the crayfish study that they're designed to support. Um, can you see my screen? Just give me a thumbs up so I know you got it, Jim. Great. So um, this is the uh, the curriculum, and uh, you can get it free online. There's supporting resources uh, with it. It's designed to be very adaptable, so you could really use it with any age um, student. It's all aligned to the next generation science standards and Common Core standards. Um, Lots of uh, lessons here that are all adaptable. I've done it with second and third graders. Uh, they all love crayfish, but it's it's great for high school and, uh, and college as well. Um, you can look at the um, freshwater ecosystems and how crayfish fit into those, uh, their adaptations, the different species of native and invasive crayfish. Uh, we have a game, a simulation that's a lot of fun. Um, the different crayfish species and other species can compete, lots of running around. Um, the crayfish as an indicator species, uh, Jim's gonna talk about that too. Um, and then uh, we get into good ways to collect reliable data uh, in the field so that that can all be shared through the River Mile Network and um, we can all analyze that data together. We also have a lesson on design thinking with the crayfish challenge. And um, this one was a lot of fun to create. If we have time at the end, I'll get into this one more, but basically the students uh, design their own uh, crayfish measuring uh, devices using the design thinking process. We worked with an expert in that to create that uh, lesson. Um, and then we get into using ArcGIS online to analyze this data uh, through uh, visualization. 
And we always think it's important for the students to present what they've done too. So we have a, a lesson that just goes over good uh, strategies for the students to be able to organize community events and get everybody else excited about this important um, crayfish study and the health of their watersheds. So just gonna give you a little bit of a speed tour. Um, please ask questions, uh, stop me um, if anything pops up you're interested in. Um, but I was just gonna give you a quick rundown for some of these lessons. Um, we have some engage activities to choose from such as a crayfish trivia activity. We suggest showing uh, crayfish if you can collect them. Uh, it's nice that most parts of the uh, Northwest and beyond have crayfish. So if you go out and look in your streams, you can, find one, we have scientific collection permits we can get you on um, so that you can be covered to collect per, uh, crayfish. It depends on where you are, if you're allowed to or not. So we can we can help with that. And uh, what a great way to get the kids excited is just show them some of these live uh, crayfish. Um, kids can brainstorm about them, where they think they, they live, their habitats, what they eat, what eats them. Um, we have nice little uh, PowerPoint presentations that you can use uh, as is or adapt them, get them thinking about where the energy uh, comes from that supports uh, life in the freshwater ecosystems. Of course, the sun, and then it's going to allow the producers to make the food and it's going to feed out to our consumers and up through the different levels of them. Uh, so just kind of easy visuals to um, talk about some of these concepts, some um, um, other graphic uh, uh, displays of how this freshwater ecosystem is organized. We get into some of the different plants and animals uh, that the students can find out there in the freshwater ecosystems. Lots of things like to eat crayfish. So that's one of the reasons why they're so important in the ecosystems. Uh, I happen to love birds and uh, turns out even ducks love to eat crayfish. They pull off the chillipeds one by one, swallow those whole and then swallow the whole rest of the body whole. So I learned something new in this, this research. Um, and what do crayfish eat? Does anybody know? Feel free to turn on your uh, mic or you can type it into chat. I'm just gonna bring up chat here so you can do it either way. What do you think crayfish eat? Scavengers. Yes, very good. They are scavengers, anything else? There's Kay just popped up. Hi, Kay. And everybody hey. else on and everybody is able to join. Um, How are you? Doing well. Excited to talk about crayfish here. The the short, yeah, the short answer is almost anything. And last time I saw Kay, she taught me this really great way to remember uh, the word detritus uh, that her students taught her. I think the students, or maybe you came up with a Kay. Um, no, it was a sixth grader. You're right. Was sixth grader, grader, right? And uh, it's, dude, try this because that's how <laughs> the crayfish are. They will, they will try just about anything, whether it's a dead fish, dead leaves, all that gook down there at the uh, at the bottom where they live, and they recycle those nutrients, work it up through the uh, food chains and and food webs. So it's another reason why they're such an important uh, species. Um, they also happen to be really great. Uh, indicators of watershed health, which Jim is going to talk about a little bit. Uh, so here's one of our freshwater ecosystems and our beaver dam helping to create more nice big wetlands. One of the places that you can find uh, crayfish if you get out there and look. Um, they're nocturnal, keep in mind, so it's a lot easier to find them at night uh, or if you turn over uh, the rocks, they're usually hiding down there. All right. So uh, what do crayfish and other animals need to live? Um, you can shout those things out too, or you can type them in chat really quick. Uh, what do you think they're gonna need down there in their freshwater ecosystems? Oxygen. Yes, oxygen, what else? Cold, clean water. Yes, cold, clean water. Those are probably numbers one and two. How about the food too? Shelter, space. So all the um, animals in our freshwater ecosystems need these things. So they're a great way to um, get the kids thinking about watershed uh, health and how we can help these animals have all these things. Um, some of the other good resources, there's a great collection of cards that you can get for free um, that I link to here. There are um, a bunch of other examples of projects you can do with the kids, like these mini research projects. This works for marine and uh, freshwater ecosystems. Just have them choose one of their favorite organisms, do a quick little um, 
research project about it. What does it eat? What eats them? That kind of stuff. Do a nice uh, visual so you're bringing in the arts. Um, and then they can all share these uh, together. Um, they can act out food chains. This is a lot of fun. So um, have your producers down in front of the room or if you're doing it virtually, uh, you can do this with Google Jamboard or one of the online collaboration tools. Uh, so you've got producers and then those primary consumers will come in there and eat them. Um, and you can just kind of act this out flowing up through the food chain. Um, you've probably done one of these uh, webs. It works for any ecosystem, uh, just get them in a circle, or this could also be done with um, Google Jamboard or one of the other uh, tools and um, have the energy flowing from uh, one organism to the next. I usually start it as the sun and then have it flow up through. Um, have them create uh, visual models of the freshwater ecosystems. Um, I usually share some examples like this one that's on our crayfish poster. You can get for free if you'd like one, just let me know. Um, or some of the others you can show as examples and then the students create their own. We have nonfiction uh, readings and activities the students can do. Um, we bring in some different math uh, activities as well. Um, some activities for younger kids that are more visual, uh, bring in some coloring as well. Here's some math you can do, analyzing the different types of uh, detritus and things uh, so they can uh, do some, some math that way. Um, field guides, short videos, poems, stories, nonfiction books. You can weave that all into the, st uh, the study of these uh, organisms. Um, works for annelids too, or whatever uh, you're, you're studying with the kids. Um, there's a uh, presentation rubric. Um, I can share the uh, editable versions of any of these things if they'd be useful for you and you'd like to change them, but um, just making it easier to um, assess and also help the students know how they're gonna be um, scored. Um, so that's one of the um, example lessons. Um, let me see how I'm doing on time here. Um, I might take a little break because um, I wanna make sure that Jim has enough time to share um, you know, his important water quality stuff. Are there any questions on any of that so far? All right, so uh, Jim, would you like to take it over now and talk about crayfish as a freshwater uh, or indicator species? Uh, sure, sure. Well, I wasn't, I wasn't gonna talk exactly about that, but I certainly can add that to it. So oh, um, sure. yeah. I'll go ahead and, um, and I'll share the screen once you're ready. Yep. I was just gonna provide a, a quick overview of the Ida H2O Master Water Stewards Program. And um, I can give a little bit about the biological, uh, what we do uh, for the biological and it, which includes uh, crayfish. But um, so yeah, I'm Jim Eakins, area water educator for University of Idaho Extension. And I'm based up here in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Um, but that doesn't mean I stay in Idaho. I actually take the Master Water Stewards Program and I go um, kind of throughout, um, well, pretty much, we're a very flexible program. So let me just, I'm going to give a quick little overview of what the program is all about. And, um, you know, we, we, we actually started back in 2010 um, and really got going in 2011 and 12 as a volunteer uh, citizen science or community science water quality monitoring program. Um, and what I, when I took the program over in 2000, early 2013, is I realized that it is a, it's a, it's a great program to use in, in the schools, in the classroom, and out of the classroom. Um, we uh, collect data at an educational level. Our protocols are relatively easy to pick up, and so it makes it um, really accessible to to students and really to people without a science background. And so that's kind of my, my audience. Um, you know, so we, so uh, the, the Confluence Project is a, is a high school uh, project where we have about 500 high school students from about a dozen uh, North Idaho uh, high schools and we do water quality testing and then we do some aquifer protection stuff and we do snowpack science and then they have to present their project at a, um, uh, um, yeah, like a conference, like a like a scientific conference for high school kids. Um, and then the River Mile picked up the we 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 had some we we started talking a few years ago and realized that Ida H two O the Master Water Stewards uh, um, uh, the physical chemical part of that would would fit very nicely with the 
with the River Miles crayfish study, um, you know, for their water quality portion. You can see there's about seven different modules. Uh, I'm not going to go into them today, of course, but um, we, we talk uh, very broadly about um, kind of the history of citizen science, some key water quality concepts and mapping and, and what, what a watershed is and things like that. And then we talk about the different uh, assessments that, that we do. Um, and so uh, the classroom, it's, it's, it's unlike some master's programs like the master naturalists or the master gardeners where it's many, many hours of training and many, many hours of volunteer work. This is a, basically a one day workshop. It started as a one day workshop. We now have an online uh, entirely self paced version of Ida H2O master water stewards. And we do master water stewards synchronously online too through the river mile. In fact, tomorrow we're gonna be starting the second day, uh, <clears throat> uh, the second half of that classroom part. And then once you've done the classroom part, um, then we, we go into the stream and I actually make sure that everybody has lots of practice to, uh, uh, with the protocols, the water quality monitoring protocols. Um, and, and notice that I also teach Project WET and there's some really cool Project WET activities that go very nicely with uh, Ida H2O. So, um, and uh, Washington State also has a Project WET coordinator too that, that teaches Project WET. And you can see here's a really fun picture of a student. This is one of the high, Jamie Esler's high school students from uh, Lake City High School. And we caught some crayfish there. That's the Spokane River in the background there at Corbin Park. And so here's how Ida H2O works. Um, you, you choose a site to monitor and um, it can be a farm pond, it can be a stream, it can be whatever. We focus on weightable streams um, because most of our protocols are, you know, need you to kind of reach in. Uh, into the water, but we can also do ponds as well. And if you have a big river, we can do some of the assessments on the big river. Um, the assessments we have, our habitat assessment, that's kind of the, the structure of the stream. What's the bottom made out of? What are the banks shaped like? Um, what sorts of you know, large organic woody debris are, are in the stream and things like that. The chemical physical are the uh, primarily dissolved oxygen and um, pH, um, temperature, things like that, as well as uh, how much water is flowing through the stream. We calculate that. And then the biological assessment. And we focus primarily on the aquatic macroinvertebrates uh, down to the, the family or order level. Um, and of course, those in, include the, the crayfish. And um, once people are you know, in the stream with their kick nets and seine nets and catching bugs, sometimes they'll catch crayfish. And we ask those volunteers to upload their crayfish data into the, the crayfish um, program and where there's a separate online training for just for the crayfish. Um, I, I assign a, uh, anybody who can volunteer uh, consistently, I assign you a kit. And there's a picture of the kit's contents here. Um, and um, you know, you can have that kit for as long as you're regularly volunteering. And that's, you know, in parts of Idaho, you might only get three months of, uh, or four months of, uh, um, of stream assessments in. Um, in other places where it's warmer, you might be able to actually um, monitor for most of the year unless the water is too high. All of our data goes into a hydrologic information system that it's publicly accessible. Here's a picture of, of a screenshot of that now, and you can see all of our sites, including quite a few in Eastern Washington. And we have a, a master water steward in Portland too, who is actually uploading data, but hasn't done so quite yet. We haven't gotten those data uploaded. So there's no, there's no pin over here in Portland, but, but we're working on that. Let's see, let me keep going here. Now, I will be talking quite a bit about the, the Clean Water Act. Um, and, and in fact, the, uh, uh, the River Mile is hosting a community uh, conversation, community gathering, and on March 24th, uh, from 3.30 to 4.30, I'm gonna go into the nuts and bolts of the Clean Water Act. Um, I, I, I talk about it in the Master Water Stewards training because it's really important to understand the history of the Clean Water Act, how it's built, and kind of how it works. And so, um, so but I'll be talking about that in much more detail on the 24th um, than, than, I, than I normally do in my Master Water Stewards classes. But notice that there's, it goes all the way back to 533 AD in the Institutes of Justinian when they literally codified Roman, ancient Roman law. And you know, the running water could not be owned and is common to, to mankind, to, to humankind, uh, as are the, the, the beaches, the shorelines and the oceans. So anyway, that goes all the way back to there. It's a pretty cool topic. We'd love to have everybody here uh, join us for, for that. 
Um, and that's about it. Now, crayfish are one of our aquatic macroinvertebrates that um, that are indicator species of you know uh, of uh, they're they're, a, they're of moderate pollution tolerance. And actually, some of the na the native ones around here barely fall within that moderate pollution tolerance. And they they are actually a low tolerance, uh, which means that they need relatively clean water. But they don't need the fastest, cleanest rushing water that some of the uh, EPTs, the Phamaroptera, Trichoptera, Plycoptera, the mayflies. And, and stoneflies and caddisflies need. Um, they are found in a little bit slower water with a little bit less flashiness to them, a little bit warmer perhaps. And so that's why we put them in the medium water quality category, but they still can't handle a lot of pollution. Well, that's all I've got. I'm gonna stop my screen share so I can let Rick get back to his portion there. Does anybody have any questions for me um, here right now? Thanks so much, Jim. That was awesome and uh, it has been so much fun uh, presenting with you through you know a couple of years now and um, we are looking forward to doing the full on crayfish and freshwater ecosystems uh, workshop um, at the end of the month uh, together along with Janice and another colleague of ours uh, Deb, Deb Berg a fantastic um, retired high school teacher so um, check that out at the rivermile.org too but I thought in case you can't join the whole workshop I'll give you a real quick uh, speed tour of a few more uh, lessons before I turn it back over to Janice um, to tell you a little bit more about those workshops. So when we get into crayfish adaptations, they're fascinating little critters. We look at their structures and functions um, as well as the uh, behavioral adaptations. Um, their life cycle, uh, they start out as eggs. They're um, coming into the world as uh, beautiful little tiny uh, crayfish. They just have a partial uh, metamorphosis. Um, and uh, as they go through their different molts, they're giving off their exoskeletons. Uh, it's a great way to blow the students' minds uh, when you have these in the classroom too. Uh, see that um, molting happen and then they'll eat the whole thing to get all the, the nutrients for the first couple days uh, after it happens. That's fascinating to watch. Um, and between 11 and 13 uh, molts, they're an adult. Uh, as I mentioned, most active at night. Um, they're nocturnal. Some of their um, structures here, I won't really go through them, but you can just kind of scan down some of their uh, greatest hits, like the cephalothorax, the fusing of the head with uh, the thorax, um, all covered by the, the carapace, that hard shell. Um, the best way to pick them up, uh, if you've never picked up a crayfish, come in from uh, the back. They can't snip you with the chillipeds. Um, they also love to get away by swishing their tail underneath them. Um, the telson with the uropods together is the tail fan with that strong muscle in the abdomen. Um, but if you're behind them, it's a lot harder for them to, to get away. So that's how you can pick them up and show them out to your friends. Um, some of the other, other great adaptations. Who wouldn't want eyes on stalks, uh, a rostrum to uh, protect them, um, all these great millipeds moving in, water over their gills all the time. So many cool adaptations. If you wanna learn more, we have a free training you can go through online. Um, and after somewhere between 45 minutes and two hours, depending on how fast a, a reader and quiz taker you are, you will be certified to participate in our crayfish study. If you'd like to get out and uh, check out what native and invasive species are in your neck of the woods, uh, then that can all be submitted through uh, short, easy little forms on the River Mile website. Um, we can get you traps potentially if you need traps and other resources. Uh, Jim is even making these awesome little measuring boards. You line up the uh, rostrum, the little beak-like thing sticking out at the front of the crayfish um, with the edge of the board and then hold out the tilson at the end and you can get a nice accurate um, measurement of this crayfish that you can uh, submit the data. Uh, Margie, your, your young friend there might want to learn how to uh, <laughs> <laughs> do the crayfish too. <laughs> Could be fun. Rick? Yeah. Margie does have a question. How long does the crayfish keep molting before they reach final adult size? That's a great question. Uh, it depends on the species, but um, you know, it, it's I think on average like two months. Um, I can check that to be absolutely sure. Um, we have a supervising biologist, actually a couple of them. Uh, one is Dr. Eric Larson, and um, I will ask him uh, to make sure I got my info right there, Margie, if you 
just remind me of your email address, put it into chat if you don't mind, and I'll uh, follow up tomorrow after I hear from uh, Eric. Uh, that's what we do if somebody um, takes a picture of a crayfish and we're not 100% certain what it is, we <laughs> send it to Eric and he gives us the 100% certain uh, uh, ID. And we are finding crayfish that might even be new species too. So if you get out there and look, you might find some new species even. Uh, so yeah, here's just some more adaptations. Let me see how I'm doing on time. Might have a couple more minutes here. These are some of the other um, sheets that are in the curriculum you might be able to use. Um, some of the other activities, um, comparing different species can be fun, making models of crayfish with clay or Play-Doh, um, uh, detailed illustrations. We have good research that shows, you know, just drawing that detailed picture, uh, labeling things, annotating them um, is such a great way to reinforce the learning, bring in some, some art, and uh, the kids remember it when you, when you do it that way. Um, you can even have them make new uh, organisms. This is what I do if the kids finish their regular uh, uh, model uh, of uh, a crayfish, they can go ahead and get creative and come up with a new organism adapted to the freshwater ecosystems. Um, have them make videos or show something you find online. They can uh, magnify them, dissect them, um, and so many things you can do. Um, let's see, how am I on time? Time check. Um, any other questions before I keep rambling away here? Can grab the data. Oh, the Jesus has been doing a pretty good job of answering questions <laughs> <Okay>. in chat. <laughs> Excellent. I'll keep going. So um, just real quick, if you want to start looking for the crayfish out there, let me show you some of the um, species you're most likely to find. It's not hard to identify them because there aren't that many. This is them on our poster here. There are only um, three common invasives you're likely to find, three common natives. Um, this is the uh, native signal crayfish. This is the only one that's officially identified now in the Northwest. You can tell them by the, um, they usually have a lighter colored patch at the joint of their uh, chile. Those are the claws or the chilipeds or the whole claw with the front legs. Um, they, uh, can vary in color, so light brown to dark brown, sometimes they're even blue or <laughs> greenish, um, but usually they have that lighter colored patch and they don't have really big bumps. If they have really big bumps like this guy, this is one of the invasives, the red swamp crayfish um, up from Louisiana and parts south and uh, uh, taking over a lot of the uh, Northwest streams. This is another one that's a big problem, especially in Washington, um, the Northern crayfish, um, notice they have very large uh, chile, large tubercules, these uh, bumps here, if you see those, it's probably a northern, they also call it a virile crayfish. This is its cousin, the rusty crayfish. Um, notice they also have uh, fairly large chile, they also have a little eye, um, almost looks like an eye ring there, so you can see through the um, chile and the rusty patch on their carapace. That's how you know. Um, so rusty, they um, outcompete our native species. They can eat all the fish eggs, all the amphibian eggs. Um, they're known for burrowing, so stirring up tons of sediment that really degrades the water quality. Uh, so that's why we want to try to find these crayfish, um, eat them if you like to eat them, or just put them on ice and um, study them, euthanize them, get them out of the ecosystems because they're wreaking havoc. It's one of the reasons why we're doing this. Um, another lesson is uh, looking at them as an indicator species. We have a little um, mystery of the disappearing crayfish you can do, a scenario where the students uh, do a little detective work to try to figure out why the crayfish are disappearing and they develop uh, plans to help uh, address the problem. Uh, they can create visual models for their plans. Um, and then hopefully they're prepared to get out there and collect uh, reliable data in the field. Um, which will save that. If you're interested, please join us for a free workshop coming up in a few weeks and um, we will give you all the ins and outs. Any other questions that Janice didn't get to? All right. Um, 
Yeah. Rick, how did the invasive ones get there? Was it through boat bilge water or not being cleaned up? Many different ways. Uh, one of the big problems were a lot of uh, schools, especially in uh, Washington, parts of Oregon, were studying uh, crayfish as part of foskets um, in, in other ways. And they brought in these invasive crayfish to the classroom. Uh, they said in fine print, like basically, you know, don't release these back out into the wild, euthanize them first. Uh, they didn't heed that advice. You know, it's really hard when you bonded with these uh, charismatic crayfish to euthanize them. So they, you know, just innocently enough, release them into places like the John Day River. Um, and now they're finding densities of rusty crayfish in the John Day River of uh, 20 per square meter or more. <laughs> Imagine that, how many crayfish are there? They're taking over the whole river system. Uh, and unfortunately, they've done modeling. Uh, Julian Olden from the University of Washington has modeled with his students um, and seen that within a couple more years, they will be in the main stem of the Columbia, and then they can basically be all over the Columbia uh, River watershed. So it's um, a big problem started just by, by schools trying to be nice. So that's another reason we're doing the study to raise awareness uh, so the students know, you know, this is a crayfish uh, we like out there, and these are ones that do not belong out there. Um, that's one of the ways. And then another big one, especially with the rusty crayfish, is uh, aquaculture. So they are good eating and folks uh, brought them in for, for um, um, an industry and they got loose and they can take over really fast, um, especially in this age of climate change because um, a, uh, a red swamp crayfish can have 500 to 1,000 eggs uh, per female. Um, it used to be that they would only do that once in a season, but now since we have a little longer season, they can do that twice, sometimes even three times. So imagine that exponential growth um, from you know one crayfish to a thousand <laughs> a few times a year, how quickly this problem can get out of hand. So do the females ho hold on to the eggs until like they're direct yeah. developers and they... That's a really great question. So you might've noticed, um, in my very quick speed tour of the life cycle, I had a photo of the, um, the female and they hold the eggs underneath. They have little uh, swimmerettes underneath that they can use to go uh, slowly through the water. Uh, but the females will also secrete a substance that allows them to hold on to the eggs. Um, even after the crayfish hatch, they'll hold on to them for a couple days um, and uh, protect them sometimes even longer. Um, and uh, yeah, they try to make sure those little crayfish get a good start in life. So there's no pelagic phase at all. They just, they hatch right. out and they crawl away. Exactly, yeah. Uh. They're just many little versions of the adults when they hatch, it's fascinating. Did you so, think there was just one native crayfish in the Northwest? Yes, like, yep. Like yeah, it's, uh, well, um, I should have mentioned that there's uh, this, the, the signal crayfish um, is the one you're going to find uh, most often in um, Washington or um, BC. I know that folks are mostly from um, those places in uh, uh, Oregon. That's what you're going to find most often. Um, but we do have these other guys here. Um, it's kind of hard to see. I'm going to just uh, magnify this a little bit. Um, but if you're over in Jim's neck of the woods, um, in Idaho and Eastern um, Oregon, they do have these um, Snake River um, pylos crayfish and also the, um, the pylos crayfish, two uh, cousin species that are out there, um, as well as in the uh, Okanagan um, Plateau region, they're finding crayfish that are very different that they think are quite likely a new species. They just don't have enough uh, data to to say that for sure yet, but that's another um, part of what we're hoping to do is uh, get more information about potentially a new species there um, and possibly another one um, in uh, near the John Day uh, area as well. So um, another reason to stop the invasives and uh, help us, you know, figure out what's what's out there before they're gone. So are new species usually synonymous with being invasive? Or are there ever new ones that are native? <laughs> yeah, great question. Um, you know, I, I'm not uh, really quite sure how to answer that. It, basically, usually they are the invasives, um, but uh, we are finding evidence of these um, um, 
what we thought were signal crayfish that it turned out to be very different. And um, we had an excellent uh, presentation at our last community call by Dr. Eric Larson. Um, and he told us that the reason uh, that, that tipped him off about this was because there was a researcher in Japan where it turns out signal crayfish are very invasive there. So there are researchers studying uh, the signal crayfish and they were comparing the DNA from uh, Washington signal crayfish to those in Japan. And it was totally off the charts how different than uh, the DNA was. Um, and so that was shared with uh, Eric Larson. And then he went over and did a bunch of sampling and sure enough, they look very different and they're, they're different in other ways as well. Um, but it was actually uh, someone in Japan that, that made the initial discovery that he followed up on and, and published uh, uh, research about. Um, so yeah, so we just don't know. It, it could be that we end up finding lots more uh, species because there hasn't been that much uh, uh, research on them. So that's another reason why I'm really excited about this project. I heard something about the signal crayfish carrying disease over into Europe where it's also invasive. Um, is yep. that uh, an issue here? Yeah, um, it's not so much an issue here except at Crater Lake. In Crater Lake, they're out competing the little newts there and causing a mm -hmm. lot of trouble. Um, but you're right, in Europe, um, it turns out they uh, they spread a disease that they they don't have immunity to those native um, species in Europe and they're just um, unfortunately wiping out the native native species there. So <laughs> we're concerned about other species coming in and just displacing the the signals and causing trouble. And other parts of the world are worried about our our native. So it's it's yeah, just fascinating. There is a question in the chat. Uh, Kay was just saying, if you want more data from Portland, she might be oh, able yeah. to help. Fantastic. Great, Kay. Thank you so much. Is the fish crayfish fishery legal? Yeah, yep. Um, it depends on the state. So in Oregon, you can actually go out and catch up to 200 crayfish a, a day and you don't even need a permit. Unless you're doing the scientific study, then they ask you to be uh, part of our permit or, or get a different scientific permit. Washington, um, you do need a, um, a permit for, for crayfish. Um, it's not hard to get, but there is a little fee. Um, and uh, BC, you're, you're in BC, right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, you would have to just check with your wildlife uh, agency, but um, I'm not sure if you need a license or not there. Is a fishery on the um, invasives, do you think it would be effective? Or would it... Uh, yeah, it is effective. If you uh, <laughs> can get out there, especially if you get out there early enough uh, before they've totally taken over the, the, the system, um, then uh, yeah, you can take them out, eat them and solve the problem that way. So when you go like hunting for crayfish, like do you use a trap? Or yeah, yep, great question. So you um, catch like whatever you catch, native and invasive? Mm -hmm. Yep, there are lots of different ways to catch them, but this is one great way. These cost about uh, eight or ten dollars and uh, you put it out um, in the evening, uh, come back the next day, and um, if the water's clean enough, there's a good chance you will have lots of uh, crayfish in your trap. Um, if you don't have a trap, you can just go out and start turning over rocks in your in your streams. Um, you can use a kick net also is another uh, popular way to do it. Just hold up the big uh, flat net or a screen, um, kick up some, some rocks and stuff. You'll turn up uh, different macroinvertebrates um, like, uh, like crayfish that'll flow into your net. Um, I always worry about hurting something when I do that. So I tend to uh, use the trap or just go out with some rubber boots and turn over rocks and it's amazing how many are, are out there as, as long as the water's clean enough. So I've looked all over central Portland, no crayfish, just a little too much pollution from our tires, from our oil, all that crap. But as soon as you get just outside Portland, if you go up to um, one of the nice parks, enough forest to clean the, the water, uh, then you find lots of crayfish. And so it's a, a terrific way for the students to realize how uh, much this matters, how much keeping our pollution out of the water can make a big difference. Um, and, you know, I just find all, all the kids I've gone through with this, they all are just super excited about crayfish. They want to help them after it. 
And it's like, you know, we can talk about these environmental issues, um, but if you, if you show them directly, you know, where you're going to find them, where you aren't and why, uh, then they really care and they, they want to uh, be part of the solution. So another reason I'm excited about this. Do you bait the traps? Uh, yep, uh, catfish or, or uh, cat food is a great uh, way to do it. You could use catfish as well if you want to spring for it. Uh, <laughs> they'll eat just about anything, but uh, cat food is very stinky. Get the seafood uh, variety, um, poke a few holes in it with your um, screwdriver and um, throw it in the trap and you're good to go. So wet cat food. Uh, wet cat food's great. You can also use dried dog food is popular. That's what Dr. Eric Larson's team uh, uses and it works great. <laughs> All right. I think uh, I might be out of time. Stop sharing for a second, and then yeah, I'm going to stop sharing, and I'm going to let Janice uh, take over. If you have any more questions, just pop them in um, chat, and I can uh, stay on a couple more minutes at the end if anyone wants to, or uh, email you tomorrow. Okay, great. Thanks, Rick. I just wanted to uh, take a little moment here at the end to uh, share the upcoming events. These are uh, what we have coming in into April. There will be more. Um, our River Mile Community Gathering on March 24th. This is um, Jim Eakins on the Clean Water Act. Then um, Rick will be doing his virtual live crayfish training. It's um, March 23rd and March 31st. It's both days, um, two to five. And then we have a crayfish conference. We do them every eight, 18 months and we are doing our second one on Monday, April 12th. And we'll be done in time for the name meeting that night. <laughs> We're yeah. done at five, <laughs> 11 to five that day. And we are, uh, uh, Rick, uh, if you ha can tell us, I didn't get a chance to look at Chris's stuff for the keynote. Sure, yeah, he's gonna present on, um, uh, crayfish uh, ecology and, and conservation, um, not just for uh, the, the Northwest, although he will address that, but just kind of uh, generally, he's worked on that for, um, I think, 25 plus years. Um, he's considered the, the leading uh, expert on, on that in the world, I believe. Um, so yeah, I'm really looking forward to that um, presentation about crayfish uh, uh, conservation, and then we'll have lots of other great experts too. Yeah, we're working on concurrent sessions and we're working on the schedule. Um, it is virtual, which is really nice because we can get people from more areas uh, versus having to fly them in and take two or three days out of their time. So that yeah. is a nice thing about the virtual um, world that we play in. Uh, all of them are free, although Rick and I are working on, as many of you who know, who may conduct virtual training and virtual offerings, um, you often get about 20 to 30 percent of the people who signed up actually show up. So we are working on um, an enticement for the crayfish conference, especially um, to get people to to join us. Uh, the for the virtual live training, the crayfish training, um, we do have. Let's see if I can keep it all together. Washington State STEM clock hours, and I. I think, Rick, were you able to get that moved up to 10 STEM clock hours or are we still at eight or nine? I, th I think they're gonna give us 10 because we have the two, um, two afternoons um, and then uh, Jim's gonna have an hour um, on the Korean Water Act that's gonna count it looks like. So folks will get 10, uh, 10 hours for, for joining us for the whole thing. Yeah, plus the virtual um, on-demand training is, is included in that. Right. So in Washington State, um, Washington teachers, I believe, each year or during when they have to get their um, credits, they have to get 10 STEM clock hours. So by doing this training, check mm -hmm. that one off. Yeah. And, and the clock hours are free. Um, let's see, we also, Jim Eakins is working on getting the University of Idaho PD. So that um, anybody from the Idaho area uh, as well as a few other states. I know I saw one um, participant working with Jim on that to see if that would transfer to their university. Um, and then for Oregon, we do have a um, uh, course completion certificate for folks down there. Although if anybody, if anybody down that way would like, wants to help us arrange for any type of other credit that will be helpful down in, in the Oregon area, 
Sounds good. I used to work with the Lewis and Clark College when I was out at Astoria, mm -hmm. and I I did clock hours for them, but they charged for them. So <laughs> we're we're easy here in Oregon. All you need yeah. is a little uh, certificate. A little they actually do it honor yep. system. So you just tell them you did it and you have your backup. Uh, that's all you need here in Oregon. Um, but Jim's deal is great because you get a, a credit from the University of Idaho. So a lot of folks just need more credits to advance and stuff. So that's another um, thing you can do through the training. And if we've got anybody from Canada, we would be happy to work with you guys to see about what we need to do. I mean, we've got a pretty comprehensive um, outlines, agendas for these because uh, the state to get the STEM clock hours, we have to jump through quite a few hoops, as Rick knows, uh, and, and Jim knows. So, um, you know, we'd be happy to to work with you guys up there on, on these as well. So, and there will be more things coming up. Um, would love to do a crayfish training this summer live. I think Jim is looking forward to being live with the um, Master Water Stewards, Stewards and Ida yeah. H2O. Um, we will be scheduling more of the crayfish training, uh, all kinds of things like that. So lots of opportunities ahead. If you're interested, you could sign up. Um, if you wanna get the newsletter for the River Mile, all you have to do is go onto the website and there's a place, several places where you can um, sign up for the newsletter or join the River Mile, join the, um, the community and stuff like that and get connected in. So thank you all for having us this evening. Thank you guys so much for coming and giving the talk. I'm just going to stop the screen share so we can all see each other. Um, yeah, so Jen, I saw that you put into the chat that you will compile all the resources and can put that on our web page as part of the talk. Yeah, everything that I saw come into the chat is on the web page. So if you just click on that link and um, our three speakers, if there's any other resources that you want listed there, feel free to email them. Uh, I'm just webmaster at packname.org or you can email them to Woody or whoever else you have a contact info for and they can get them to me and I will add them to the website. You're amazing, thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, Jen, do you, I don't know that anybody in name, does anybody in name get our newsletter? I do. You do get yeah. it. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, I get it as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I will be getting another one of those out soon. If anybody has anything they want to put on it, um, go ahead and get that to us. So Jennifer, I'll work with you guys um, on getting, I, I put in chat the links for the, these upcoming pieces. Cool. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for this evening. I'm going to stop our recording. And Thank you for hosting. Bye.